Major underwriting for A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Foles was provided by the Baton Rouge Convention and Visitors Bureau. In Baton Rouge, our past is your present. Baton Rouge, authentic Louisiana at every turn. And People's Drug Stores, serving South Louisiana for generations. George and Shirley Piku are proud supporters of A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Foles. And by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Our mission is to tell Louisiana's story to the world. And by the Louisiana Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. Where you have this architecture, history, music, and the bittersweet cry of the blues. Especially the blues. There you go. How about a dozen? Red beans and rice. We rolling, y'all. We're a nation of immigrants, a country with roots in other soils. Nowhere is that more true than in the country of Louisiana. I'm Chef John Falls, inviting you to tune in to A Taste of Louisiana and a new series dedicated to our food heritage. Louisianians are descendants of seven primary nations that have influenced every dish we cook today. Welcome to A Taste of Louisiana. <laughs> How y'all doing, guys? Nice to see you. Nice to see you. How are you doing? John, good to have you back. Thanks for the line. How you doing? Hello. Hey, Jim. All right. How y'all doing, everybody? Oh, wow. So nice to have all of you here today. Thank you so much. I'm Chef John Falls, and welcome to my kitchen as we continue to do what we in Louisiana do best talk about our great cuisine and culture. And today, we're focusing on the English of Louisiana, as you can tell from uh, Rosemary John there. What a great job you do, you've done. That's great news. Thank you, huh? And uh, uh, mo most people think of Louisiana, they think of uh, France, they think of Spain, they think of, of uh, the big plantation homes in the sugar industry. But wow, did the English have an important role here. And today we're going to talk about the Battle of New Orleans. And I, I'm feeding you too. So y'all just relax. Yeah, I'm feeding you. Yeah. <laughs> good, good. Though the American colonies declared themselves independent of Great Britain in 1776, true liberty wasn't achieved until 1783. Just a few decades later, England decided it was time to reclaim her North American colonies. War raged and it appeared Great Britain would be the victor. But they had not yet captured the mouth of the Mississippi River. The Battle of New Orleans literally changed the course of history. Ali Baltras visits with us about this decisive American victory. From 1793 to 1815, France and Great Britain were almost constantly at war, and America, unfortunately, was caught in the clash despite declarations of neutrality. Finally, in June 1812, the United States Congress declared war on Great Britain. In August, the British captured Washington, D.C., burned the Capitol, the White House, and other public buildings. U.S. Major General Andrew Jackson, Old Hickory, was chosen to defend the American South. Yeah, Andrew Jackson was a congressman from Tennessee, actually the, the first congressman from Tennessee. He was also a lawyer and a traveling salesman. He had fought a little bit in the a Revolutionary War, and he had an immense hatred for the British. Jackson had traveled 350 miles in 11 days. He was tired, he was dirty, and drenched from the rain. But he declared to the citizens of New Orleans that he had come here with a single purpose, to drive their enemies into the sea or perish in the effort. Really interesting mix of soldiers fought here at the Battle of New Orleans. Regular people like you and I, people like the Free Men of Color, a hunting group, there was Choctaw Indians here, Baratarians, pirates here, but also militias from Tennessee and Kentucky and Mississippi came here, and just common people from New Orleans fought along the same line. Jean Lafitte, the suave, unscrupulous pirate who lived just below New Orleans in Barataria Bay, offered to help in the battle. Jackson refused until Lafitte played his trump card. In fact, the British first asked John Lafitte to fight on the British side, but he weighed his options, and the Americans um, were eventually willing to pardon him for, for his piracy if he brought his gunpowder and his shot to the battle. And that was the reason we won, was mostly because of the amount of powder and gunshot we had on the American side. 
On Christmas Day, the British Major General Sir Edward Michael Packingham arrived. The British were confident that New Orleans was an easy prize. With victory, Britain would control America's heartland, including its major artery of commerce and trade, the Mississippi River. January 8th was a foggy, foggy morning. You can imagine the Americans standing on this rampart, this line, awaiting the British coming. They knew the British were coming, but the fog held down for a little while, and then all of a sudden it lifted, revealing some 5,000 redcoats marching at them. The British were caught in their own crossfire. Chaos and confusion reigned, and the British found themselves helpless in a fight against inferior troops. In the 45-minute battle, Packingham was mortally wounded, as were two other generals and 2,000 British soldiers. There were only six American casualties. Sadly, the War of 1812 had ended on Christmas Eve, but with slow communication, no one in New Orleans knew. The night before the battle, citizens gathered with Ursuline nuns in the convent chapel to pray to Our Lady of Prompt Succor for an American victory. Well, I know this, I know that while they were praying, our, the superior promised that if we were successful, that every year she would have a mass of thanksgiving said, and we'd say the Te Deum, that's a prayer of thanks. Obviously, Our Lady of Prompt Succor was on the general side. Even Jackson declared that divine intervention achieved his victory. The city notorious for parties celebrated this victory. Newspapers constantly reported about the balls held throughout the city honoring Jackson. On April 1, 1815, a farewell dinner was given in Jackson's honor. The menu included oyster gumbo, ragu of red snapper, fried trout, veal cutlets, filet of beef, roasted wild turkey and duck, asparagus, peas, strawberry and lemon tarts, and wine, coffee, and cognac. What a celebration for the general and the troops who defeated those who had defeated Napoleon's best. What great history here, y'all. What, what great history about the evolution of our state. And you heard about all the balls and parties that were held after the Battle of New Orleans? Well, let me tell you, Andrew Jackson shut down, really under military rule, that these crazy New Orleanians couldn't go out and party every night. There was chaos in the city. Everybody was celebrating. So he put a freeze on all parties, including Mardi Gras. Well, they decided that they would have a, a ball Washington instead in honor of the first president. And let's see if he would shut that down. Well, he did, so they decided to have a ball Jackson <laughs> instead <laughs> to honor him. So, you know, we've been, uh, we've been a little bit conniving uh, ever since those early days to try to make sure we get our partying and good, good food in. What great, great history here, y'all. A couple of wonderful guests in the kitchen with me today. First of all, uh, uh, a wonderful winemaker, John Siegel of Pontchartrain Vineyards right here. Thanks for being back with us. Uh, great to uh, be here, John. And uh, thanks. thanks for sharing sharing a little port with me too. I mean, we're gonna cook with that, plus we're gonna, a little toast later. You brought enough, right? We only have eight, uh, 80, 90 people. Plenty more, plenty more. And then Billy Spidell, one of our great historians here, not only uh, an authority on, uh, on the Civil War, but also just a great go-to guy when you're talking about military battles and all that. Billy, thank you so much for being here. And Andrew Capone from the right. Fort Butler Foundation, he's uh, here with us, Fort Butler, the great fort man by African Americans during the Civil War. So this show is a little bit about the Battle of New Orleans and our uh, attempts to maintain our country and keep it free. So they're all here today, and uh, thanks so much. And then Rosemary John on the uh, on the bagpipes there again. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for the great uh, for the great work. So y'all, you, you heard the menu at uh, Jackson's uh, farewell party. You heard the menu. That was roast duck, and that was oh, and you know he was a horrible eater. And we're going to talk about that in a, a little bit. But I started to look at, it and I decided to do one dish that he liked and one dish that he hated. <laughs> because they were ready to get rid of him after a little while in New Orleans, even though he was our great hero, and I want to tell you why about that. But uh, look, look here, uh, teal duck or wood duck, one of his great dishes, and of course, you can imagine those sharpshooters on the battlefield could certainly get this near the river and near, near the marshes around Chalmette. So we're gonna do a little wood duck uh, here today, and we're gonna begin by putting some Thing, Jackson hated uh, bacon fat. 
Uh, but that's what they had to use, bacon fat or lard. That was our options back then. So, of course, we're going to use a little bacon fat. It gave a good smoky flavor uh, to the dishes as well. The ducks, you just want to season them really well. A little salt, uh, a little pepper, and don't forget to season the inside of those ducks because when you cook any type of game, that bone is structural, keep the flavor from getting out into, uh, into the ducks. And as Louisianians, we love our wild uh, game. And then just a, just a little flour uh, on top of it. That's um, just a, not too much. You don't want to dredge them in a, in a whole bunch of flour right there, but um, uh, just, just enough to make them uh, kind of stick to the bottom of the pot to get that gratinade on there. So I'm going to kick this fire up nice and high. And what we want to do is just to brown them long and slow. That's the key to wild game. There's no fat here. So you want to add fat to it and kind of brown them long and slow in the process. So I'm going to take the little ducks and I'm going to put them down into my cast iron pot, my enamel cast iron pot, which cooks really nicely here. A little bit more salt on the top of them. And then, of course, a little bit more flour. Now that I've put them down into the pot, I'm making kind of a light roux at the same time. So I'm going to let these cook for just a, a, a second. As I, uh, Billy, a question about that battle of... Uh, uh, th th most people have forgotten, I think, of the importance of, uh, of that battle early on, didn't they? Uh, we don't think much about it. They didn't realize that even after the battle was over, that England had designs on getting the western part of the country, right. Texas. People wanted to declare Texas a state. Well, good. So now, into, you see my ducks are nice and brown here. Now, of course, this is one of the things Jackson really didn't like. He didn't like a lot of seasoning. Onion celery, bell peppers in all of our cooking, bell pepper, garlic in the dish. I mean, oh, garlic. Look, we love a lot of garlic, right? <laughs> Not Jackson, huh? Keep it out of the pot. Um, put the rest of it in there. <laughs> now I'm going to just saute that around for just a minute. Of course, uh, it was winter time, so there was some citrus fruit available. I'm going to put a little apples in here. We could have put citrus in it as well. The bacon from the bacon fat would have gone in. And then y'all right here, thank you, John, a little, <laughs> little red wine on the dish. And this is going to sit here and smother or fricassee, I guess I should say, with the lid on the pot. I can add a little stock to it, put it in the oven if you want to. This is going to sit and cook for about an hour or so. And this is what it looks like when it's done. Take a look at these beautiful little ducks, teal or wood ducks, on top of pecan rice dressing. And all of the spice and all of that in there. Uh, Jackson had a hard time with you. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Y'all, Andrew Jackson arrived in New Orleans through the Florida parishes. Many believe he traveled what is now known as the Old Military Road, right along the edge of what is now Pontchartrain Vineyards in Covington, Louisiana. John Sago and I talk a little bit about the battle as we poach pears and what else? His port of New Orleans. Y'all, about 45 miles southeast of this spot, Andrew Jackson was preparing for the Battle of New Orleans almost 200 years ago. And right out here on the road next to Pontchartrain Vineyards, where I'm standing today, is Military Road. I saw that sign and I was wondering, John, is, um, does that name have anything to do with uh, Andrew Jackson in the Battle of New Orleans? Uh, coincidentally, it surely does. <laughs> and uh, had everything to do with the fact that he showed up in Chalmette after have, having come from the Mobile area down through this area, headed off the British right at the 11th hour there, and then wrote a report to the War Department after it was over to say, we need to build a system of military roads. So, so it was mainly a way of making sure that military and settlers and everybody could come in and out of the South and, and, and be protected. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, now, now y'all, John Segoe has been the owner and proprietor of this vineyard for uh, six, well, I mean, you found that it's 16 years ago or whatever. Now, this is a little bit different because in Louisiana, we do have wineries, but they're a little different from theirs. Well, from the beginning, John, our, our pursuit was to produce wines more or less in the traditional vein uh, as, as accompaniment to food in the European tradition. Well, I searched out the venue today because you're the only 
port producer in Louisiana, and I needed port to cook a great English dessert. We're doing poach pears with port. You ready to make some of them, huh? That sounds ready like a great idea. Them? Okay, I have a little bit of uh, water here, and John, why don't you go ahead and throw the, uh, uh, the sugar. You can just pitch it right in. This is a poach pear that is very traditional in England, and of course, most European countries. It came to Louisiana, and just about any pear is acceptable here. Just look for the ones that's kind of firm. You don't want them too soft, otherwise you'll cook away. Now, John, a few of the uh, a few of the flavors. Uh, you can throw a cinnamon stick in here, and the good thing about this, yeah, you can just pitch it on in. The good thing is this isn't too. Uh, you don't have to worry too much. One stick's couple enough. Now, one, one's, okay, one's enough. But hey, two wouldn't hurt either. You know. Okay. <laughs> and uh, just a couple pinches of those nice cloves. You can throw them in, and just uh, throw a couple of them down, and just a sprinkle of that wonderful uh, nutmeg over there. And I'm gonna do this while you're getting the nutmeg. You can sprinkle a little bit in. I'm gonna put some bourbon vanilla in here because I like to put a little bit vanilla and I'll make my own uh, uh, vanilla at home, but of course use any good pure vanilla. And now, oh, this is starting to smell pretty good already. Yeah. Now, of course, <laughs> yeah. the magic uh, the magic ingredient, uh, uh, the port. Now, uh, you, you are the only port maker that I know uh, in New Orleans, so I'm gonna put about a cup or so, a cup and a half of uh, the port uh, in here, and it's just absolutely uh, wonderful. It's great flavor for this. The more port I put in, the darker the color. Mm -hmm. So now I'm gonna put the pears, I'll peel them, and of course you can put little decorations into them if you want to. I'm gonna put them in here. Now normally I like to cover the pears with uh, a cloth, put a plate on top of them to keep them down in the liquid, Poach them for about 30 minutes until they're soft, but again, not falling apart. Take them off of the fire, put them in the refrigerator overnight, and John, take a look at how gorgeous wow. those are right there. Now, those are poached in port and are sat overnight in, the, in that wonderful port of New Orleans. So you want to take a little taste of it? You have a Absolutely. knife there. Just kind of wipe that pear for us. Nothing too formal here, you know, just... Uh, Oh, just a look. How am I doing? Oh, that, you're doing that, good. Now you can picture. cut that one in half, and we'll each get us a, a little, a little bite of it. It's really a. Oh yeah, there you go. I'm gonna cut that in half. And, do the same. and, and of course, you should taste that nice port. Oh, cheers. Oh. Hey, thanks a lot. Ah. <laughs> Are y'all clapping for the music or the poach pears, huh? <laughs> Tell me which one. Both, I'm sure. Y'all, thanks so much. What a, John, what a great, uh, uh, out in the vineyard uh, that morning and doing the poach pears with the port. Just really great. Just really wonderful. Man. You know, a great story, y'all. The British would have probably taken New Orleans and we would all be speaking English. <laughs> yeah. Properly. Yeah, we'd be speaking proper English. <laughs> Legitimate English. Uh, had the British not decided, well, New Orleans is an easy take. Well, I don't worry about that. Let's stop to eat. So they actually stopped, set up camp, uh, uh, created a really great big feast as they were waiting for Pakenham to come in, the great military leader from England, and to come in and let him march into New Orleans and take it. Had they just walked on in, on that winter day on Christmas Eve or whatever when they were there, they'd have probably taken uh, the city of New Orleans and instead of beignets and cafe au lait, we'd be doing uh, scones and uh, tea uh, over here, which is really good too. But anyway, wonderful. You notice the bagpipes here. Uh, bagpipes were at the Battle of New Orleans, right? Yes, they were. There was a number of Highland regiments who fought alongside the British. And actually, the uh, bagpipes were considered an instrument of war officially by the British. And the, uh, the Scottish regiments had a big reputation. It says a lot that the Americans won against them. <laughs> but can you imagine these group of, uh, of uh, Cajuns and French and Tennessee long rifle and free men of color on that battlefield and then all of a sudden here comes this regiment of bagpipes across the field. Hey, that make me shoot. Okay. <laughs> anyway, y'all, just, a, just a, a really, really great uh, great history. Oh, yeah, I'd aim. I, I wouldn't wait for no whites and no eyes, I can tell you that uh, right now. Uh, John, there's also a great story about Packingham being 
then after he was killed in New Orleans, shipping him back to England in a cask of whiskey. Is that uh, folklore or truth? He said Packingham was pickled and sent back to, uh, you know, and, and, and not, not disrespecting his death. But uh, was that true or folklore? Do we know? Uh, I think one of your experts really? here says it's probably true. Billy? Legend has it that it's true. Legend has it. It's true. Huh? <laughs> We'll jump back on that. I have to cook, y'all. One, uh, one of Jackson's dishes that, by the way, y'all, all of this was actually cooked at his farewell dinner. And that's what we're doing here today. And, of course, the beautiful redfish. Redfish ragu. And they were always trying to put redfish ragu on Jackson because it was one of the great dishes of New Orleans. It was the beginning of our spicy and flavorful cuisine with tomatoes and all of that. So what do we begin with? A nice redfish. And then, of course, we fillet it first. We cut it into nice fillets. Shrimp went into the dish, and then, of course, a multitude of seasonings, which always, because Jackson was a very bad eater, right, Andrew? I mean, he, he, he did yeah, yeah, he was a, a very eccentric and finicky guy, John. He was about 6'4", very thin. He had uh, been shot a couple of times in duels and, and, and suffering from lead poisoning. So we, uh, his, his system didn't tolerate very much food. He was, you know, very thin. And of course, the, 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 the New Orleanians were always trying to give him some type of a really nice dish that they really love, so they were always trying to feed him something. So y'all, in my dark brown roux, equal parts of oil and flour, cooked to that magnificent peanutty brown color. For, we use roux for thickening, for color, and for flavor. Without a roux, it's uh, not something Jackson hated. Put out a roof, Jackson hated it. But anyway, so anyway, I'll, uh, take a look at this. All of that, a nice garlic going into it. Onion, celery, bell pepper. Of course, I'm going to throw more garlic in it because we loved it. A little bit lemon juice. Uh, we're going to make our roux first. We've already made a stock. And in fact, in this pot right up here while this is cooking, I have a nice stock that's made with the fish and the shrimp. Take a look at the shrimp in there. This is a nice, sh and of course, they would have gone all out for Jackson. They'd have put all that wonderful uh, stuff in it. Now, the Ursulines, y'all, the role that the Ursulines played. In fact, Billy, they, they prayed all night for a battle, and Jackson actually thanked the Ursuline nuns uh, for helping intervene in the, in, in the victory. But there was another story to that. When they, when they came bursting in the chapel, they, yeah, they yeah. promised to yeah, have victory. So, so they came running down the middle aisles of, uh, of the cathedral of the, of the church there on the Ursul at the Ursuline convent, and of course uh, yelling victory in uh, the middle of the mass, but there was also a second battle in New Orleans. Oh yeah, the people were very ungrateful to, to Andrew after the, the battle. They praised him as the great hero for saving New Orleans. Right. But then, when he didn't lift martial law right away so that they could start partying, <laughs> Alatois and all Antoines, they were hurting. Yeah, the right. merchants were hurting, and they turned against him. Yeah. In fact, the, uh, the uh, federal judge uh, was making so much commotion about it that uh, Jackson sent him out of town. <laughs> but that only lasted two days. When he came back in power, he pressed charges against Andrew Jackson for contempt of court. <laughs> and find him a thousand dollars, and when he left the courtroom, here's the victor of New Orleans being charged a thousand dollars for contempt, and then he wouldn't come back to New Orleans for a while uh -huh. after. But they finally lifted it, y'all, and Jackson came back. So I have my fish. I put my stock in it, my tomatoes, all of my wonderful seasonings. I'm going to put the fish in right at the last minute. I'm going to let it poach away, season it with a little salt and pepper, and take a look at what it looks like when it's done. Now, we would serve this over rice or one of those wonderful uh, things, but I have to have a lot of nice fish in there. Take a look at that. Really great stuff. Uh, English peas here. English peas is another great side dish uh, uh, to, to England. Now, John, there was a lot of great toast. Uh, that day, and I'm going to give you one of the toasts that Jackson uh, uh, did. And this, uh, look, I wrote it down for you. I don't want to mess up Jackson's words. The army of the U.S., the boasted legions of Europe, can no longer mock because comparisons have been made on the battlefield, not on paper. <laughs> Battle of New Orleans. Mm. And John, I understand that this feast started at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and, and uh, we're still going. I don't know how clearly they spoke, but I'll, I'll do my best. This is uh, Jackson's, another one of his toasts. 
To the worthy few who fell in defense of Louisiana, their memory will be, ever be dear to Americans. Their death was avenged by the blood of thousands of the enemy. Hear, hear, huh? Ah, I tell you, it was rough times in the city, y'all, and time flies when you're enjoying good food and good conversation with friends in the kitchen. Thanks for stopping by as we continue to explore our unique food heritage and cook up another great taste of Louisiana. Bagpipes, please! And you come on up here and get a little bit of stuff here, Carolyn. You got your one of these plates? I'm gonna give you a look at it. To purchase the Encyclopedia of Cajun and Creole Cuisine by Chef John Bowles, featuring more than 750 traditional recipes, a CD-ROM of the book, or a copy of the program featuring all three episodes of Today's Culture, call the number on your screen. Major underwriting for A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Foles was provided by the Baton Rouge Convention and Visitors Bureau. In Baton Rouge, our past is your present. Baton Rouge, authentic Louisiana at every turn. And People's Drug Stores, serving South Louisiana for generations. George and Shirley Piku are proud supporters of A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Foles and by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Our mission is to tell Louisiana's story to the world. And by the Louisiana Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. Where you have this architecture, history, music, and the bittersweet cry of the blues. Especially the blues. There you go. How about a dozen? Red beans and rice. We rolling, y'all.